Welcome back to the Skid Factory. This is episode four of the Kevin build. We've got Kevin down here at Rogan Industries up on the hoist and we're going to get stuck into one of the most important parts of a drag car build, which is the rear end setup. These things basically sit on the back wheels the whole time down the strip, so you've got to get this bit right. It's currently got a Borgwarner 78, which it comes from factory in it. These are excellent for doing sustained single peggers, or if you get sick of that, you can do what Ethel did and weld up the center and do sustained double peggers. It's not gonna be good enough for our application though, so all this is coming out. Matt's got a whole bunch of minty looking parts there and we're gonna piece them all together and make a race rear end. Someone over tighten that. Apparently these are rare. How much more room is up in the guard though? Well, uh, not a lot really. Not without tubbing it and moving the whole thing in. Oh yeah. It's heavy though. Are we putting tubs in now? You know I love tubs. Yeah. Not sure that Matt wants to do it. <laughs> two, two seater and tubs, Matt. I wonder if we can turn it into a two door as well. Put a Calibra badge on there. Yeah. Is it too late to just get a Calibra? <laughs> this is how things escalate. <laughs> We've thrown the new housing up into the space with everything removed, um, just to see how it looks, what's gonna fit, what's not. We've chucked the 235 radials that, we, that were on the car when we got it up, and obviously they're gonna fit no worries at all, but we've also put a 275 up in there and it's, it's gonna be a bit tighter. Um, the car previously had around about a 275, but I think it was it was running slicks, not radial. Um, but yeah, the stance of the car was very, um, but basically they just jacked the back up so it, so they fit. We don't really want to do that, so we're going to have a look, a bit of a look around and see what we can clearance in there. Uh, it already has been clearanced a fair bit, but we're, we're, um, we're willing to give it a go and have a bit more. So the next step is um, we're going to just pull the housing back out again and that we've got a, another set of wheels for the back which are just basically 15 by 10 versions of the ones that we already have. We're gonna chuck some old um, radials on that and then Matt has a, it's basically like a trailer axle that you can adjust the length of and you bolt the wheels on, put it up in there, just keep moving it around so you know that everything is in the right place and that then gives him his housing width um, measurement that he needs and then we can work from there. Uh, so Woody's going to go pick those wheels up from Macca tonight. <clears throat> In the meantime, Matt's been assembling the flat pack of uh, sort of laser cut brackets and stuff that, that will go into making the, the housing complete and also these arms which are all tacked together now. So this is the original lower control arm on the back or trailing arm. Uh, spring is mounted in that which then goes up to the body. 
we're no longer going to have that set up anymore because we're going to have coilovers in the back which will go up through the boot floor and join into the roll cage so that's the replacement arm so it's a lot simplified they're all just tacked together at the moment that's the top arm short fella so it's all going to use the original pickup points apart from the uh penhard rod penhard penhard no you don't want to do the pan hard rod joke? Well, whatever. <laughs> that's, got, that's no good. It's, pre it's pretty much junk for... It's, it's junk no matter what, but it's really junk for, for um, radial racing because it basically upsets the diff as soon as you have separation of body and, and um, diff. So that's going to be replaced by a, an A... What did you call it again? A track locator which is kind of like an a-frame that that mounts to the body and then out to the diff so it does the same job as the pan hard but it doesn't upset the 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 way the the diff separates from the body what about a watts linkage watts linkage yeah that's like a pan hard rod but there's two of them <laughs> with a thing in the middle of it <laughs> Is our rear wheels, 15 by 10 Pro Stars. Thanks, Mac, for picking up. You're a legend. Uh, 4.5 backspace, I believe. They could be different. We're not too sure. This is what the marketplace ads send. These have a bead lock. If you don't know what a bead lock is, I'm going to pull it off and I'll show you what it is. This is probably common knowledge to a few people, but for those who don't know, as the name suggests, bead lock. So the bead of the tire normally seals on this part of the rim here. There's nothing actually stopping the tire from spinning on the rim. When you've got so much torque being applied to the wheels, the tire can physically move on the rim. So that's what a bead lock is for. So this outer rim here is, this is obviously, this is welded onto the rim. So the front of the rim gets lathed off and this gets welded on there. And this locking rim, after you fit the tire, holds the tire in place, lock, locks the bead. You can get bead locks on both sides, inner and outer. These are just outer bead locks, and that's literally how it works. So you just slip, slip the tire on, uh, do all those bolts up correctly, evenly. You don't want to do them up unevenly and bend that rim. And then I think it's 20 foot pound you tighten them up to, I think it's the general rule of thumb. Once that's done, throw some air in them, away you go. You want to make sure your tyre is set in the rim correctly. Some people may use lube. Matt has just informed us that using lube can probably fight against you because it makes it too slippery and the tyre won't grip in there correctly. Then your lock rim goes on. You can do these all up by hand first and then tighten them up evenly in a circle, star shape. Just got to make sure that rim goes down evenly, otherwise it will bend and cock you up. We're building a speedway car, mate. Is that, oh, is that the speedway? Going, so I'm, I'm still got to come in a fair bit, Al. Isn't that called something, Alan? When the wheel's sticking outside the guard? Look like poke or something. Mexi flush? Mexi flush. <laughs> You still ride over there? Still touching that panel bar bracket over. Look, by the looks of it. What am I hitting? You're hitting the panel bar bracket on the back, and I reckon the tub's got to be very close up the front, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. And that 
looks like it, if it went up, it'd, well, I'd be ploughing into all this mm -hmm. anyway, if it went yeah. up from there. You like that right height? I reckon that's pretty much Conway's Ben. Can I say something funny? What did the farmer say to the cow that was on his roof? What you moving up there? Get off my roof. Industry standard. How good was that? <laughs> what is this? This is a zip ties leaking through the boot floor. run the shock out as wide as we can to get maximum control over the housing rear end and then we'll run the anti-roll bar in here.
got the upper and lower control arm brackets tacked on there. Control arms are made, they've been bolted in. Al made up some sweet little alloy spaces and Matt has just finished off tacking together the track locator on the rear there. So track locator, self-explanatory, the track of the car on this vehicle had a panard rod which basically held the diff in the center. When the car was raised with that panard rod, the diff would actually move to the side. Uh, on Mark's Fairlane, which we've previously done, being leaf spring, the leaf springs hold that diff smack bang in the center, and then Al's car was a triangulated setup, so that the arms being on the angle, that holds the diff in the center, which doesn't move side to side. This track locator is welded onto a bar at the back there, which whenever the diff goes up and down, this holds it smack bang in the center, and it's not gonna move. Uh, there is some uh, adjustment in these lower control arm and upper control arm brackets, which I've been speaking to Matt about a little bit. There's, the, the, the answer to that is basically, you've got adjustment if you need it. You wanna be uh, maximizing the traction of the vehicle to the surface you're using. This car's being set up for a small tire radial car is what we're gonna call it, I suppose, but yeah. as Matt would said, any, you change your tires, you change the surface, you can adjust things to make it work. And it was to do with the center line and... Yeah, there's a whole lot of science to do with it, but it's just, you know, if you're going to go to the extent of building this style of housing, put adjustable brackets on it. You can adjust it, you can learn, you can, yep. you know, you can learn things, you can you can have some fun with it and, you know, see how things work, really. But, yeah, there is a science to it. Um, again, it's totally different. Every car is different, every track's different. Yep. But, Speaking um, of different cars, have you done, like, VR, VS combo before yourself? VLs, yeah. Yeah, VLs. Yeah. Similar. So is that the same? Very yeah. similar, yeah. 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 So now the diff's got to come back out. Matt's going to put it onto his diff jig. We've got to we've got our width with the trailer axle. We know how wide the diff housing's got to be. So we're going to chop this down, put in some big bearing housings. We've got brakes, everything to go. Yeah, we've on. got a heap of stuff still to work out, but we do know a finished width that we need to be, and we can work back from that. So now you've got the fun job of hours of welding. Hours of welding. I'll leave that to you, man. Making sure we cut it in the right spot. I'll be back in a couple of days. <laughs> See ya. left Matt in peace for a few days to get what he needs done done. I've come back and picked up Kevin and taken him home with the old diff just sitting in there just so we can roll it and um, we're almost at the finished product here as far as housing goes Matt. Yep we're pretty much done we just got to make some brake lines and she'd be done. So there's probably a few few bits that are extra here on here since last time we we looked at it uh, obviously we talked about the the track locator I keep calling it the A-frame, even though that's not its name. Um, basically replacing the pan hard bar. So just to, to go over it again, the reason why we don't like that pan hard bar in this in this application, so, so we're shooting for eight, eight O's. That's what our cage is allowed to, allowing us to run. So that's, you know, it, unless you're the Hoff, that's pretty fast. So what? Are, why is this required over that pan hard bar? The pan hard bar, 
basically works in an arc and pushes the body or the diff sideways because they work in an arc this way so and we want to put separation in the car um, and we don't want the tyres going yeah. either side it unsettles the car the tyres are always a, not a neat fit so we don't want them rubbing on anything and this is basically the f a really free moving way of controlling the yeah. body so when you say separation just for the people playing at home what what do you actually mean by separation so we want the body to separate from the tire that's sort of your goal in radial small tire yeah. racing so there's a whole theory about it which we don't need to go into and everyone's <laughs> yeah. got their own theory um but yeah that's what you are chasing yeah if you're sucking the tire up in the guard you're basically the you sucking the tire away from the track and yeah. not planting the tire all right, so I see you've got a few strengthening bits in here, and this is our shock mount. Shock yep. up to the shock inside mount of the up body. into the bar in the body. Yep. And it's also incorporating this anti-roll bar. Yep. So can you give us a, a little like a a quick explanation of what what that anti-roll bar does and why it's important for? Is it particularly radial that it's important? No, it's Im important for all drag racing cars, I believe. Like, there's plenty of people out there who don't run them, but you'll see a lot of cars they'll twist off up when they leave, and it's just, when personally, when I put them in cars, it creates a really consistent car, and you don't, you eliminate a lot of twists, uh, a lot of, you can actually eliminate tyres spinning on rims by yeah. preloading certain sides. And so it's keeping the, the diff planted, yeah. both tyres doing equal as close to equal absolutely work. yeah and so. it's not just a drag racing thing like circuit racing guys run this stuff more so on the front they'll have something of this size on yeah. the front and a smaller one on the back but yeah so it just it just creates this a, say an any roll bar say a sway bar or whatever that's called an any roll bar as well the difference with this is this doesn't really allow any it has no flex no flex yeah. at all whereas yep. a sway bar obviously has has flex, flex and if you run a sway it. bar in a drag racing application they will have flex in them and they'll actually sort of bunny hop the car down yeah. the track which so are, it'll wind up and then absolutely come back yeah and, yeah it, has, just, it gets a, gets attention in it okay that's uh, pretty much covers the housing side of the rear end obviously we've got to have a center 40 spline strange yeah it'd be strange <coughs> aluminium aluminium yeah yep. yeah so we've gone up we, do, we use 35 spline on both the other cars that Matt's done for us. Um, 35 is probably enough, but we're erring on the side of safety. Obviously, any loss of traction or you know a broken axle is pretty much ends in tragedy. Um, so we're we're looking at what's happening to other people and trying to avoid that because we don't really want to uh, get hurt or wreck things. So we're heading towards a 40 spline. Um, I don't know if you explained earlier that the, the, the only real difference apart from the extra strength with the 40 spine is that they're, they're not built to be equipped with a um, limited slip or any other type of centre. So it's just, it's all axle and a full spool, which is what we run anyway. So it seemed like the obvious choice. We'll put the stock brakes back on it. That shouldn't be too difficult. And uh, we'll bolt it back into Kevin once it's back home. And when those axles get here, we'll assemble the whole thing in the car. That will be later on. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, thanks Matt, of course. <laughs> Anytime. If you've got a Toronto and it needs tubs, call Matt. <laughs> They're getting easier. <laughs>
Does it? Oh no, it does, doesn't it? No, it doesn't have a H, it's K double N. Commodore service interval, change oil at 10,000 kilometres, change panhard rod bushes at 5,000 kilometres, change these at 20,000. What if it was a stretched ambo or? If it was an ambulance, um, surprised they didn't have more ambulance drivers inside the ambulances because they were about 500 kilometres for panhard rod bushes. The worst idea in the world is making a Commodore Ute into a stretched ambulance. Ambulance? Ambulance. Wambulance. A what? Oh yeah. That's very precise. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, real, they're a real pain in the ass. Yeah, right, right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. <laughs>